protecting your charity against fraud, as you should be able to see on the screen there. My name is Matt Crichton, and I'm from the ACNC's education team. As my name is listed there, alongside two other names of um, very important guests today, Mr. Oliver May from Deloitte and James Bennett from the ACNC, who will guide us through this uh, panel discussion format about all things charity fraud um, and provide some practical tips and advice on what charities can do to help you know, prevent and mitigate and even manage instances of fraud. Okay, we've got a few things to get through today, but actually before we do get to the agenda, although I have put that on the screen, um, a few bits and pieces of admin. Uh, first things first, if you're having trouble with the audio for this webinar, you should have an option to dial in um, and that may help out. In the confirmation email you would have received upon registration, there will be some instructions there on calling a number to uh, listen to the webinar if, if you are having trouble otherwise. Also, we've got a couple of colleagues answering questions as we go through. So if you have any questions that you want answered as you're listening, uh, feel free to put them in the question box there in um, the GoToWebinar um, control panel. And our colleagues, Chris and Bree, will happily assist with any questions. And look, if we're getting a lot of the similar questions come through, um, we may uh, address those issues live with Ollie and James. If we can't get to your question, because we do have quite a crowd in today, we will endeavour to get back to you later via email. Also, uh, we have the slides as you can see on the screen here, but you can also see us speaking. So depending on the device you're using, you should be able to toggle between viewing the slides and viewing the speakers or viewing everybody if you want as well. I think that's an option. That will depend on the, the device you're using. I think if you're using a phone or a tablet, it may be a matter of swiping between the, the, the viewing options. But if you're on a, a desktop computer or a laptop, it may be that you um, minimize the windows and you can see the, the different options there. And then if you want to see everyone or just the speaker or, or just the presenters, then you've got the option to, to do that too. Okay. And of course, we are coming to you from our um, home studios of varying degrees of you know, audio and, and visual professionalism. So if you do come across some of the the uh, typical sounds of the home, that that's the reason why we're all still working from home. So there might be the odd dog barking or lawnmower outside and that sort of thing. We hope it won't interfere too much. Okay, now on to the um, agenda today. So we're going, going to get through a a fair bit, we've broken it up into three main sections. We're gonna have a look at um, basically what fraud is and some of the elements of fraud, the types of fraud and, and looking at charity vulnerability and susceptibility to fraud. And then some of the more practical aspects in that third section there of um, preventing, mitigating and managing fraud. And that'll touch on some of the warning signs too. So we'll have a look at the, the sorts of things that as um, people involved in charities that you should be looking out for and then we'll finish it up with a question and answer session. And again, as um, as I mentioned, if if there are questions that keep popping up throughout the throughout the webinar, then we'll address those at the end. But feel free to you know watch the uh, discussion proper before you send a question too. Okay, let's get started. Um, this is the first topic: uh, what is fraud? But before we do so, I'll just ask the two guests today to just introduce themselves. Good morning, James Bennett. Um, from the ACNC, do you want to give the audience a, a quick overview of your role at the ACNC and your experience? Thanks, Matt. Yes, yeah, so I'm the Director of Compliance at the ACNC. That takes into account our intelligence and investigations functions. Uh, I've been there for about two years. It's part of a nearly 20 year career, mostly in the public service and largely around compliance and audit, audit functions. Great. And Oliver May. Um, not from the ACNC, from Deloitte. So do you want to give the audience a, a brief introduction of um, your role at Deloitte and your experience? Absolutely. Thanks, Matt, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I, I started my career in law enforcement in the UK, mostly in the Serious Organised Crime Agency, which is now the National Crime Agency, and uh, it was a bit like the AFP or the FBI. And after that, I became the head of counter-fraud for Oxfam GB, working across uh, 54 countries, 31,000 staff and volunteers, uh, and now I assist nonprofits, uh, government agencies, and corporates to tackle integrity challenges like fraud, corruption, sexual exploitation, abuse, and uh, counterterrorism. 
and I'm really passionate about helping this sector to uh, protect the awesome work that it does uh, from that unfortunate side of, of human nature. And it was a particular pleasure uh, uh, to collaborate with the ACNC to develop the governance toolkit. Yes, definitely. And we hope a lot of people have gotten a lot of use out of those resources on the website over the past couple of years. So clearly lots of experience to draw upon today. And let's get into it with the first part of today's session, which is what is fraud? You can see the question there. Um, of course, everyone has an idea of fraud and um, just generally, colloquially, we know we know what fraud means. But getting beyond that, James, I'll, I'll go to you first. Could you just give us a quick overview of, of what fraud may encompass beyond that which is the regular understanding, I suppose? Sure. So look, there's the uh, criminal definition where we're really talking around someone obtaining a benefit or creating a loss for another one, another person by deception. I so said that's the criminal definition that will normally be pursued by law enforcement sort of agencies, uh, the police. There's a broader sort of concept, and I think this is what we're really talking about, is to me it's misuse. And it's one of the things that I guess we see uh, in, the, in the work that we do at the ACNC is where someone is misusing their position or misusing charity resources or using one to do the other uh, to obtain a benefit for themselves. So I think, yes, like I said, I would define it as misuse and it's that broader sort of concept. Uh, one of the things we often end up talking about with benefit. So a charity decision maker using their position to get a private benefit, usually, usually money, not always, uh, from their position within the charity. And that's definitely the thing that we see more and I think it fits within that broader concept of fraud that we're talking about today. Yeah, right. Ollie, what, what are your thoughts on this question? What is fraud and what it encompasses? Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of points that, that charities sometimes miss on this. And I think the first is that fraud is, is not just about making a gain. It can also be about causing a loss. So there was a, a case I dealt with where a logistician may have committed fraud to swing a contract to a particular supplier. Uh, they were falsifying quotation documents. Um, and that wasn't because uh, they'd received a kickback. It was because they were under time pressure and wanted to get the job done. And um, they had that mission right. focus. But unfortunately, of course, in doing so, they caused a massive overpayment. So there was that loss there. Um, another thing I think that's important to remember is that it's also about, uh, it could be fraud to misrepresent um, your skills or your capabilities. So mm. uh, if individuals lie on a CV, that could be fraud. Um, and if a charity overdresses its capabilities in tenders for contracts, that could also be fraud as well. Right. But I think one of the most important points that I'd make is that um, I think we need to avoid assumptions when we're thinking about the severity of a fraud. So there's a big temptation to see um, you know a fraud of only a few dollars as, as a small fraud mm. um, but the reality is actually that could be quite a big deal if the person committing it is in a position of authority or enjoys financial delegations because um, that that effectively means that the individual has shown dishonesty and that puts everything else they have control over at risk um, right. and whilst that might sound harsh Remember, we're not talking about honest mistakes here. We're not talking about um, good faith errors. We are talking about an intent to deceive, and that's serious. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that the, both of the responses to, to this question here, you've you've touched on these these elements um, on the screen, and and dishonesty obviously being one of the underpinning elements of fraud, whether that be, as James mentioned, the crim criminal definition or the the way in which we um, understand it colloquially. Um, We'll have a look at the kinds of fraud. Um, you've both got vast experience in different areas, and uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, anecdotally, you would have seen so many different kinds of fraud it manifests in different ways over the years. But um, we'll, we'll think about it in the charity not-for-profit sector, and we'll we'll attack this. I think we're in in two ways. First, we'll have a look at the kinds of fraud that um, we've seen. And is, it, is that similar to other fraud that may pop up in, in business or, or other, other sectors? And then secondly, we'll have a look at whether or not charities in particular are, are vulnerable or, or particularly susceptible to fraud. So first, let's have a look at the kinds of fraud. Ollie, I'll go to you first this time. Um, in your vast experience over the years, um, what kinds of fraud do you th have you seen as being common 
um, amongst charities and, and the broader not-for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. Look, Matt, I think that, that question that you raise about whether charities experience different frauds to other sectors is a, is a really good one, because I think the reality is that fraud is opportunist, right? So whenever you've got humans and things of value in the same place, and they're going to reflect the kinds of business processes that you have. So if you procure things, you're at risk of procurement fraud. If you have a payroll, you're at risk of expenses processes, you're at risk of expenses fraud. So um, in reality, charities experience many of the same kinds of fraud as other organizations. Um, and things I've seen uh, kind of on an internal side include uh, false invoicing, um, timesheet fraud, uh, lies on CVs, as I've mentioned, um, abuse of assets like you know phones and vehicles, um, making out checks to cash but then claiming on the stub it was free legitimate expenditure and then taking the cash i've seen that that still happens mm -hmm. um double dipping where you uh report the same output to two different funding organizations um externally uh suppliers double charging uh, delivery partners falsifying outputs um and of course you know remember people just straight up stealing assets and stocks yeah right so lo lots of different kinds there and actually you touch on a couple of good points um being uh, you mentioned the external and internal, and I think it's it's worth taking a moment to uh, focus on this a little bit. And James, I, I think you've got a couple of um, points to make here that um, fraud can happen um, it, amongst people involved in a charity, whether it be internally in the organisation or externally, such as, as Ollie just mentioned, suppliers, contractors, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, look, Ollie's completely right. And with fraud risk mitigation, I guess there's the classic distinction between external and internal. So I guess what we sort of see from our work for an external, uh, we see some cases where uh, someone outside of the charity is misrepresenting themselves as a member to the public to get donations. Um, I'd refer people to the ACCC's website, Scamwatch. There's a charity mm -hmm. section on there which talks about some of the ways that, that that's going on. So it doesn't cost charities resources, but it is reputationally bad for the sector and dishonest. Um, we also see people attempt to, external people attempt to defraud charities. So that might be a program that the charity is running where people are applying for grants or support that they're not entitled to. Um, we saw that occur through the bushfires, for example, with mm. a lot of donations came in, and unfortunately some people made claims to charities or for support when they weren't affected. Internally, right. yeah, you've, def you've definitely there. And I guess um, the sort of two, I guess I'd sort of put this into two categories as well within internal. We have seen charities set up to obtain money, but not, not intending to do the purpose for which they obtain, which mm. they are promoting themselves. That might be public donations, um, or it might be government grants and, there's been a number of prosecutions over the last 12 to 18 months of um, people who set up charities that were completely frozen from the outset. Right. You can also turn to, within a charity, people misusing their position to obtain a benefit. And this is where, you know, Ollie was talking about procurement risk. So people directing uh, charity contracts to providers from which they're going to derive a benefit might be a kickback or it might be their company that they're, employing via the charity. So they make a profit at the back end coming out of the company or things like misuse of uh, charity credit cards, um, other direct sort of payments from the charity to, to themselves that they're, not, that they're not entitled to. So these are the sort of things that we do see, unfortunately occur sometimes in the sector. Yeah, right. And, and I think what's coming through in some of these examples is the uniqueness of, of a charity's position in that they're sort of set up for a different purpose to say a classic business or other industries, which is a good way to get onto the second question I wanted to address in these kinds of fraud is that whether or not charities, because of that unique position they hold, are particularly susceptible to fraud or have particular vulnerabilities to fraud or particular kinds of fraud. Um, there may be a, a mixed answer here. I, I'm sure there are there are a bunch of elements we can get into. I'll, I'll go to you first, Ollie. What, what's your view of a charity's position in relation to fraud? Is there any particular susceptibility or vulnerability? 
Look, I think um, you do occasionally hear people who think that, that charity sectors are more vulnerable to fraud than, than other sectors. And I'm actually not sure how helpful it is to think of the charity sector as, as more susceptible to fraud than you know, any other given sector. Um, I think the reality is that any organization in any sector, uh, any organization's resilience to fraud depends on how well it has evaluated its risks and put in place things to control them. Mm. So for me, the real question is not whether uh, charities have more fraud than other sectors, but whether they recognize the risk and respond to it as effectively as other sectors do. Right. Uh, and there's definitely scope for improvement there. Um, that said, though, I think you know charities do share the common fraud enablers of many sectors, but there are a few common things that we often see that are part of charities' unique risk profiles. So uh, one of those is cultures of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and trust is important, of course, but it, it needs to not be at the expense of vigilance. We need to find ways to hold that trust and hold that vigilance together in tension. Um, hierarchies of values as well, where we might not want to deal properly with a fraud issue uh, because we're worried about you know, reputational impact or uh, we, we might not want to invest in the procedures and the systems that prevent fraud because they're seen as less important than budget lines that might more instinctively feel that they relate to delivery, um, mm. even though these things are about delivering safely. Um, and in particular, a, a race to the bottom on, on admin and, and overhead um, that reduces appetite for activities that are really important for controlling risks like uh, you know, finance, uh, procurement systems, HR, IT. Um, charities, I think, can, can be susceptible to that risk of their um, honorable operational ambition outstripping the resources they've got to do it safely. And that creates gaps that, that fraudsters can, can jump into. Mm. Um, there is, I think, a, a myth that, um, that larger charities are less susceptible to fraud than smaller charities because they have the systems. Um, I actually don't think that that stacks up when you unpack it because larger charities have more transactions and more funds. So actually the scope for fraud is larger. Um, the one thing I think that determines whether a charity is, is more at risk than another is, is, is that point that I made just at the outset. How well have you assessed your risks and put in place effective and proportionate countermeasures? And you can do that whether you're the smallest food bank in Sydney or Australia's largest and most celebrated international NGO. Yeah, right. They're, they're really good points. And I, and I think that, that fundamentally gets at it. It's not... It's not the sector as, as some homogenous lump. <laughs> there are so many um, variables within the sector and, and it's about the, uh, assessing risk. Um, James, what are your views on this? Do you think that there are particular susceptibilities and, and vulnerabilities within the, the, the charity sector, he says, uh, having just um, said to not look at the sector as a homogenous lump? But um, what, what do you, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think uh, what Ollie said is right. We I hear arguments of we're less susceptible because people are passionate about what they're doing. And I mm. hear arguments that we're more susceptible because we don't have the resources and the, and the skills and we don't commit to fraud prevention. Um, I've not seen anything where it's measured, whether it's more or less. Mm. Um, I hark back to, yeah, it's opportunity. There's like money there and there's people involved unfortunately and it's about your sort of protections one of and i thought as well as two more points one is we had a look at some of the bushfire charities in a report late 2020 mm -hmm. one of which was a large multinational used to dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars if not more every year and they were targeted uh, in some instances in fraudulent claims and were able to identify it. We we're also dealing with a charity went from relatively small to all of a sudden having tens of millions of dollars and the need to change um, their governance and structures to protect against fraud was really there. So you can see this shift um, between having frameworks and suddenly needing frameworks that maybe you don't have. And then I think the one item and I have spoken all about this that we've talked about it where is what we talk about as a founder syndrome or um, where there's an individual a couple of individuals who are central to that charity and right. um, have been usually been there all along but largely control decision making mm -hmm. and it's something where that person is so trusted and is the heart of that organization that their actions aren't necessarily um, governed or looked over as strongly mm. as they could be. And that opens up a risk that's 
probably in the, that might be in the sector more than in others, but I, yep. that's purely anecdotal. Yeah, right. That's a good point. It's, it's a good one to recognise too, because I think that that founder's syndrome, as, as it's known, um, is one that I think many people may recognise, particularly if a small charity grows and becomes larger and gets more um, you know, supporters and money over the years. And, and it's one that, as you both mentioned, uh, the right policies and procedures in place would help to mitigate against any um, yeah, any uh, bad turns that a charity may take under the, the founder's syndrome. But actually, just, just before yeah, we move on to the... Absolutely. Oh, yeah, go yeah. ahead, James. And, and it, it comes back to Ollie's point. It's about recognising that this is something that's there, that the circumstances mm -hmm. might have changed, and now it's to put in these processes to, to identify and mitigate this risk. Just before, there, there was something that you both mentioned, actually, Ollie, you mentioned it first, and, and just before we move on to the third part about um, some of the practical tips of preventing and mitigating um, fraud, I, I did want to touch on one thing that you mentioned, Ollie, which was about, um, you called it the race to the bottom, and this idea that ch charities are under such pressure to use their limited funds for, as many people will, will have heard, um, it, in this discourse for the cause, I, I use air quotes there, um, that there's a, a sense that putting money towards other things, such as mm. you know, fraud mitigation and, and, and uh, systems and procedures would be, would be um, unnecessarily or, or even wrongly diverting front funds needed for the cause of, of the charity. And, um, uh, that's a, that's a myth that I think um, needs to be busted, I suppose, in, in the charity sector because putting funds towards these sorts of things is important in that it helps the charity ultimately pursue its charitable purpose without having to, um, you know, worry about the the um, knock-on effects of serious things such as fraud. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, Matt, and I think you know cl clearly there is a sort of a another end of the spectrum where there are charities that are spending way too much on that sort of thing and, and, and that's a governance and stewardship issue but the reality is I have seen that far less than I have seen charities um, under pressure from the public and from donors and from the kind of expectations we set ourselves to minimize the um, business support costs that we really need to do our work safely and I think it's important to remember as well that um, a lot of work that charities do um, is actually quite technical um, mm. and, and can be quite specialist and it needs these uh, these supports around it to make sure that it's being done safely. And James, of course, as from the regulator's perspective, spending on these sorts of things is not only is it not breaking the rules, you know, within reason, of course, the details matter, but um, it, it's actually encouraged to ensure good governance. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it can be a return on investment sort of question. You know, mm. you, you put in fraud prevention, you prevent loss, you maintain yeah. reputation. Uh, our expectations or the way that we would regulate this would be for charities to be run well is my short version. <laughs> and, you know, what the sort of fraud prevention mechanisms you might have, they're going to depend on are you small, are you large? And also, what are you doing? Like, are you giving out direct cash to people who apply for support? Now, that's a higher risk sort of uh, venture. Mm. We would expect that probably a higher level of um, protection with built into your governance and your processes. Okay, let's move on to the, I suppose we we'll call it the practical um, uh, section of the, of the webinar today, the discussion, which is the prevention and, and, and mitigation strategies. Um, of course, and, and we'll move on to managing fraud too. So we accept that some things may pop up and, and a charity will no, need to know what to do in case they do come across it. So how can we, how can we prevent fraud? How can, how can we you know, set up strategies to mitigate it? James, I, I'll go to you first. Are there any um, particularly good, maybe not the silver bullet or the panacea to solve everything, but particularly good steps that a charity can take or should take to be able to prevent um, and mitigate fraud? Sure, look, it fundamentally starts with having good policies and procedures that address where you're at. 
And so that's the size question. Mm -hmm. um, it's also an activity question. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and where are you spent? Where is your money going? And how are you controlling that? Now, look, some of that is gonna is and it's gonna. It's a little bit of horses for courses, unfortunately. Right. What we do do is um, there's a bunch of guidance on our website, some sort of stuff around fraud prevention. Mm -hmm. um, there's the governance toolkit, which can give people a heads up. Um, we've also put out some small, there's a small charity library on there that's sort mm -hmm. of a place to go for starting policies if you're small. Mm -hmm. If you're large, there's massive amounts of um, research across all sectors around fraud prevention, and most of them are, are going to be relevant. You know, there's things around having clear authorizations of expenditure, double sign off on certain expenditures, um, copies of invoices in specific locations. If you're mass, if you're really big, you can get into data analytics around your expenditures and your payrolls. Mm -hmm. um, your board up to date with accurate reporting keep control of your charity credit cards who's mm -hmm. got them how are they spending them. go back and order them um it's surprising how often you will find private purchases showing up on credit cards and they're really easy to to sort of detect think about your procurement and your decision making where where are who's making the decisions on where that what is often a really substantial amount of um expenditure going um i think the second part to policies and procedures is that they're live. Right? They're not just something that sits on a corporate intranet or in a folder on the shelf. People actually have to um, understand them and implement them. And sometimes that therefore go requires um, spot auditing that they're actually being done properly. That's a really effective sort of mechanism. Um, again, it's getting more costly. Choose your, choose your weapon, depending on, on, on where you're at. Um, I'd also pick up some of the questions coming into this webinar was a lot of what can small charities sort of do. Mm -hmm. I think, um, as I said, there's a guidance on the website, but uh, I'd say there's two things. There's a low hanging fruit around asking yourself a couple of questions. One is, is there a conflict of interest here? Mm -hmm. And two is, are two people going to look at this expense, whether it's on the way through or afterwards? Yeah, right. It's sort of pretty cheap and simple to do um, and then the other thing for small charities is to be aware of your growth as you yep. become bigger as you bring in more assets under your or resources under your control you know be thinking are our current processes still appropriate do we need something more do we need some more skills that we, that we don't have yeah right right um ollie have you got you got anything to add to that? Um, I, I know James has covered quite a bit of territory there, but uh, but um, in your experience in this area, what would you say are the strategies that a charity can put in place for preventing and mitigating fraud? Oh, I think James is bang on. Um, and I would echo that really strongly, that point about procedures being really important. Um, not only do they set out the best way to avoid a risk, um, but if you've got them, it makes it much easier to identify variants. Um, you can't know what wrong looks like if you don't have a right. Hmm. Um, I think as well, having policies and procedures is, is the first thing, um, but the second is making sure that they're appreciated and followed. Uh, charities are very action oriented, they're very innovative, they're very outcome focused. So sometimes procedures can be seen um, as bureaucratic red tape, including hmm. those that, that control for fraud. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to do in the sector is think about how we frame compliance with procedures in charities. Um, and some messaging that I've found to work really well is framing procedure, following procedures as about teamwork. So number one, following procedures allows others to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it. You know, other teams work depends on whether you follow procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, procedures are not just about, they're not about policing you, they're about you working together to make it easier to spot others who might take advantage of your charity. Um, and thirdly and finally, you know, procedures are not the only way that we tackle fraud. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about following them. It is a really important part of the picture though. Um, but I would also, uh, that would also lead me on to a quick mention of culture. It wouldn't yeah. be a webinar on fraud if we didn't talk about culture. Um, we need in the charity sector to create cultures where it's okay to raise concerns and challenge things. And I think this, this links back a little bit to the point you raised, James, about founder syndrome. 
Um, it can be a problem in a charity of really any size, um, but you can often guess whether you've got the right culture long before anybody encounters something that they need to report. You know, how mm. are your people behaving in meetings? Um, does everybody contribute? How egalitarian is, is your workforce or volunteer group? Um, or are you dominated by a small number of powerful voices? Um, do you have accountability bottlenecks? You know, are there particular individuals who could stop or, or block concerns um, before they get to the right place? I think um, a couple of points you, you touched on there, and, and culture, um, I, th I think, brings it to, to life, is the idea that procedures being there not to not to police the staff and not to be overly bureaucratic or, or, or be a hurdle to getting things done because as you mentioned many people in charities are action orientated and just want to get stuff done it it may be worth questioning um the the procedure if it does feel like it's overly bureaucratic or if it's too hard to follow then that may be a warning sign that you might need to review that procedure it's not that the procedure itself the concept of a procedure is wrong or, or inherently um, bad in preventing you from getting stuff done. It's that it may need to be reviewed. It may need to be updated because it could have been written six years ago and, and be no good anymore. So this idea that, that cultures in an organization will, will question the organization and, and lead to improvements and, and review is a really important aspect. It's an excellent point, Matt. And I think, you know, one of the challenges that charities can often experience with procedures is that they are either too bureaucratic on the one hand um, and suffer from low compliance because they're so difficult to comply with and perhaps are actually disrupting the charitable purpose um, or they're, they're, they're too loose or not followed on the other. Um, and of course, the key to making sure that your procedures are um, effective and proportionate is having a risk assessment. Um, and there's a right. good risk assessment template um, financial abuse in, in the governance toolkit. Um, there is a challenge, I think, around the way that we do think about risk, you know, whether it's the charity sector or not, um, we're not good at understanding risk. And we've seen that problem in particular over the last 18 months with, with the pandemic. Um, and that kind of makes sense. You know, our, our brains are evolved to make very simple decisions based on the, the likelihood of, of mm. whether there are juicy berries in the forest over there or bears with pointy teeth. Mm -hmm. Anything more nuanced is a challenge. Um, but that's fraud, right? Fraud is constantly trying to hide from you. That, that's in its DNA. So um, starting with a risk assessment and, and doing it in a really consultative and collaborative way and gathering as many perspectives as you can from across your charity as you decide what the right kind of policies and controls are for you is absolutely critical. Yeah, just to add in there, I think the sort of procedures that we've largely been talking around are around expenditure and uh, procurement sort of processes and you don't want them to be inhibitively onerous there's also a set of procedures around whistleblowing so if you think someone's done the wrong thing and even if it's a senior person do you know what to do mm. um, what is our organization gonna gonna do so that's that's another set of procedures mm -hmm. um, or policies that just can just sit there in the background and be used when needed so it's mm. not onerous they're not in your everyday business mm -hmm. but it gives you a confidence about what to do if you if something's a little bit stinky yeah right <laughs> absolutely and um, all right we'll move on to some actually just before we get to warning signs i think people will be interested in the warning signs aspect of it uh, uh, th this final dot point here on the screen if people are looking at the slide um you see we've got oversight there james i just want to uh, touch on this one with you briefly the importance of oversight at the board level um in much of the acnc's resources we, we refer to the board as responsible people it's a, a legislative yeah. um, d uh, uh, definition of, of what a responsible entity is but um, oversight of the board is really important too of course it's striking a fine balance you don't want every single operational decision to have to go to a board meeting to be approved but at the same time the board shouldn't be kept in the dark from many of the operational stuff that allows the charity to do what it's set up to do yeah, look, and again, I'm going to say it's scale, it changes with scale, uh, but fundamentally what you want the board to have is enough is, is enough and the right information mm. to know what's going on in charity, charity and ask questions. Mm. So in context of fraud, a lot of this is going to be um, financial reporting, like mm -hmm. 
because that's clear and then you can actually show where the money's going. Mm -hmm. You might have uh, policies within charity that talk about expenses over a certain amount or procurements over a certain amount need to be either approved or reported to the board, so mm -hmm. before or after the fact. Uh, but the fundamental question is enough information for them to know what's going on and that's going to that's going to vary. Yep, for sure. And getting it to them too. So it may be that um, in a, a, a regular standing item on the board's agenda is some aspect of oversight of operational thing, which I, I assume many charities would be doing anyway, but um, making sure that that step is appropriate for the size and the activities of, of the charity involved. It is. And, look, and we, we see, so I'm thinking about some charities that whose function is to give out grants, for example. Hmm. You know, those grants are then report what, what's done in a the month or the quarter um, are reported to the board and saying, hey, this is the money we've given, this is why we did it. Um, here's the people who signed off on this. We've declared that there's no conflict of interests in that decision. Mm. Um, to me, that's where board would get. And at a large and a high procure procurement risk sort of uh, charity, but that's the sort of um, detail that board needs to know that when the money's going out of the charity, it's going out appropriately. Okay, let's move on to some warning signs. Ollie, you get first crack at this one. So what are some of the indicators that there may be some wrongdoing afoot in a charity? And and of course, we're not we're not trying to give a list of um, you know conclusive proof of fraud, but but things that may indicate something's um, not quite right. What are some of the things that you would suggest people involved in charities, whether they be small or large, look out for? Um, look, I think most people these days would, would recognise kind of the most common examples of red flags, you know, expenses claims that look doctored or multiple authorisations just below someone's authorisation level or the uh, the finance manager driving around in a new Maserati, that, that kind of thing. And, <laughs> and there are those lists online, by the way. You can search for lists of red flags online if that's something that, that you want to get into. Mm. They're massive um, mm. because, you know, they're very contextual and very dependent on the circumstances. Um, but I think there are some more subtle warning signs to look out for, um, which suggest that your overall risk is higher in your organization. Um, and some of those things would be, are there supplier relationships that certain people in your charity guard quite tightly? Um, are there uh, managers or leaders who are commonly authorizing procedure overrides? Um, are, there, are there systems that are clearly vulnerable to fraud, but you know, no one seems to do anything about them? They just trundle along. Mm -hmm. um, do you, and this, this reaches back, I think, to something you mentioned earlier as well, Matt. You know, do you think that it's impossible that fraud could happen to your charity or that your people are less likely to commit fraud because they are committed to your mission, which, mm. which, is, a, which is a myth. Um, these are enabling factors that I've seen before in environments that were really at risk of charity fraud. Yeah, right. That, that's, a, that's a really good point, that last one, because um, I think we all think that. The, the people that we know, the people that we work with are the good people. <laughs> of course, fraud couldn't infiltrate our organisation. I think that's a common one that, look, we're not, we're not trying to encourage um, rampant <laughs> cynicism and, and, and almost paranoia <laughs> of your workplace if you're in a charity. But of course, it's, it's just recognising the reality that um, the, the warning signs may point to uh, risks if not wrongdoing, even if you believe your organisation is is um, pretty safe from from such things, James. Uh, That's right. What can you add to um, the warning signs here? Sure. I guess one of the, the probably the biggest thing that we look into is what is this aspect of private benefit, people getting private benefit from their work mm -hmm. with the charity. It's something that's come up in sixty of the last hundred investigations that we've done. Right. That means we've looked at it didn't mean we found it to be a problem, but it means we looked at it and it was something that we felt was worthwhile looking into. And I guess it arises largely in two sort of key ways. And the first one is, is procurement, procurement from companies related to the decision makers. So if you want to talk about uh, warning flags, you know, do you know that the company you're buying from is, is owned by the person making the decision or the wife mm. of the person making the decision? Mm. If, if you do know that, have you actually gone through a conflict of interest sort of uh, decision making, uh, a, a conflict of interest assessment in that mm. decision making? Because 
it's not naturally, it's not necessarily bad. Often people will get market or below market rates from these related sort of companies. What we're looking to see is that the decision was made in the interest of the charity and not the individual who will der derive um, an element of financial remuneration. And I guess the other side of it is direct benefit. And you know, I keep coming back to misuse of, of charity credit cards or payment of bills for people, cars, accommodation, that sort of thing, travel, um, international travel when we could was another sort of one. So if your charity has credit cards, pays for travel, pays for other expenses, you can audit those, particularly credit cards, they're really easy. Or you can make sure that the approval of the other expenses are done by someone else. People shouldn't be approving their own sort of expenses. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that, that the point you made about a conflict of interest is a really important one. So if you've got a really strong conflict of interest policy and, and procedure, and the organisation, this comes back to something you both said earlier, if the organisation knows about the culture of the organisation is that a conflict of interest is is dealt with in a confident way, thoroughly, then that can mitigate against many of these uh, you know, potential potential avenues for fraud. Let's have a look at managing fraud before we get into some questions from today's audience. So sometimes things are going to slip through the net and organisations will come to a stage where they have to manage something that has happened or is in the process of, of unfolding. So what to do when you do come across instances of fraud? And again, I, I understand that this will be largely uh, dependent on the context, as we mentioned at the very beginning, there's this small scale fraud right up to massive large scale criminal fraud. So, um, James, I think I think we'll go to you first, and then Ollie's got a few things to um, to add. But what what should an organisation do when they do come across an instance of fraud, whether that be the, the small scale stuff or, or even right up to the, the the larger criminal stuff? Sure. Look. When, if you become aware of an issue or an incident, in most cases, there's gonna be some reporting obligations. So some of that is to us, either formally or informally. Um, we do get contacted by charities of where issues have arisen, and we welcome that. Like that sort of proactive declaration, usually with a, and this is what we're doing to fix it, um, isn't likely to get you into trouble with the ACNC because you be, you are identifying it to us. Mm. Um, there may be other reporting requirements. If it's signif highly significant, then it's likely to involve your state's police force, for example, or the, or the AFP. Um, if it's overseas, we've got a different sort of set of questions there. Um, so I would say identify your regulatory uh, obligations in that sort of instance and report as required. The next thing is fix it. <laughs> you, might, you might not be able to um, get the money back or the resources back, but if you can um, rectify the problem, and that might be people or processes, whatever that is. Um, and I'd point to a case in our annual report from a few years ago where a charity had been defrauded by an employee. They went out, they fixed it. Um, they were willing to go public and say that this incident had happened and mm. that's a reputational sort of um, aspect to it as well. Yeah, right. Uh, Ollie, what can you add to, to this part of the discussion? How can a charity manage fraud if they do come across an instance of it? I well, fully agree with everything James has said, of course. Um, and in particular, you know, if, if a charity is following the ACNC governance toolkit, then it should have some kind of response plan to follow. Um, and that's really important because it's going to be a stressful and risky event and you don't want to be making it up as you go along. You want to have done that preparatory work so that everybody knows what they need to do at the right time if it happens. Mm. Um, I think as well, when, when you do take action within that response plan, it's important to remember that you're not just managing the risks of the incident itself, also the risks that you create by the actions that you take to respond to it. So you have to get the right technical advice um, and that might come from lawyers, HR professionals, forensic accountants, uh, risk and compliance professionals. Um, I would also say as well, be careful about letting the value of the fraud decide how much you need to do about the incident. Mm, yeah. um, as I mentioned earlier, a small value fraud is not necessarily a small risk issue. So look at what it shows you. 
Does it show you that you've got a key person uh, who may have been dishonest? Has it exposed a gap in your procurement processes or payroll practices or expenses procedures um, that could be abused to a much greater extent? Um, but I think my, my, my key point here, and, and this I think is really important because I don't hear this enough, um, my most important message is that finding fraud is a good news story. That we need to challenge narratives that detecting a fraud automatically means that the charity is weak or corrupt. Actually, fraud is a common business risk for all organizations. It is doing the right thing. It probably means that your charity is role modeling stewardship and transparency and accountability. It takes these things seriously and it's got dedicated people who will do the right thing when they encounter something wrong. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, I think probably a counterintuitive one for many people. And I can see a link to the earlier point you made about the admin costs argument too. It, it, they, they pull on uh, similar intuitions, I think, in that admin costs are bad because it's diverting funds away from the cause. Whereas in, in reality, it, it, it's supporting the cause. Similarly here, in a, being open and honest about having detected and managed fraud is bad because it suggests the organisation is weak or corrupt, as you mentioned. But counterintuitively, it's, it's, it's not. It actually shows that the um, that they've got strong governance, um, a strong governance underpinning the operations of the organisation, and it's able to deal with fraud confidently, manage it, and then come through it and, and talk about it openly. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it reaches back, I think, to a point that James made about whistleblowing. Uh, so very often when a charity launches a new whistleblowing system, um, you know, whether that's in a hotline or a policy or some awareness, uh, detections go up. You know, people um, raise concerns about things mm. and we might misinterpret this as a rise in fraud or issues. But what's really going on is that um, people are more aware and they feel more confident and the charity is taking the issue more seriously. Yeah, definitely. OK, that uh, brings us to some to question time. So that's the formal um, discussion for today. We have had um, quite quite a, a lot of questions come through and I'm sure James and Ollie are both um, eager to to face them and provide some some useful uh, answers. I'll, um, I'll, I'll get at a couple of the more uh, common ones. Uh, I'll start with one about working from home, actually. Um, so there's been a couple of questions about how how uh, the the expansion in work from home everywhere may have affected uh, fraud risks. And does um, this, this work from home revolution uh, make charities more vulnerable to fraud? And, and I suppose the follow on from that is, is, is that is there anything we can do to, to mitigate risks in working from home? Um, Ollie, I'll go to you first. I suppose this touches on some digital security, um, given that we're all operating um, digitally on our on our computers from our, our kitchens. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I had a couple of thoughts about this question. Um, we've, we've definitely seen an uptick in phishing attempts, um, you know, exploiting the distance between us. So. Um, make sure that you have a culture where it's okay to phone up someone to check that what's been received is real. Mm. Um, I've seen a case where a CFO was uh, impersonated in asking for a payment to be raised. Oh, right. Unfortunately, that, that CFO was part of a culture where it wasn't okay to raise concerns. Um, and that's how that, that issue was, was able, to, um, able to occur. Uh, the other thing I would say as well is beware confidentiality. Um, we're seeing some risk around people having conversations on Zoom or what have you without realizing how much can be heard by neighbors or others. I'm next to my front door and I'm pretty confident that most of the people in this building can hear this. That's okay <laughs> because it's public. You just need to have that awareness and we're talking about confidential charity issues and especially issues relating to um, you know, financial matters and so on and so forth. Um, another thing as well is remember that when we're all working together in one place, there are a load of informal checks and balances on behavior that you get when people share that space. Mm. So it's useful to think about how you're going to replicate that if we're all spread out. How are you going to preserve that sense of tribe? How are you going to replace that informal oversight with, with formal checks? That said, um, be really cautious about what you do to respond to the perceived risk 
of greater scope for timesheet fraud um, when people are working from home. Um, I am seeing some organizations in some countries using platforms to, to monitor employee activity at a very granular level. That might be okay for them, it might be okay for their, for their, for their situation, but I would warn that if you're tempted to do that, think really carefully about the risk that you could actually elevate fraud risk through making your employees and your volunteers resentful and disempowered. Be really cautious about that. Mm, yeah, good points. James, have you got any thoughts about the work from home um, aspect of today's working world and, and how that affects risk uh, risk of fraud? Not on this one. I'm happy to leave it with Ollie's answer. <laughs> yeah, he, he, covered, he covered it quite well. But I will come to you for um, uh, the next question, which I wanted to ask because uh, it's come through a bit and it, it's somewhat related. And given the agency's experience in um, some reviews with charities following the bushfires, I think this is pertinent. Uh, so a couple of questions about fundraising and online fraud and how best to receive donations and and is cash more vulnerable to fraud, for example, say street collectors or, or, or collectors at large events and and how about online platforms? Is, is it okay to use online platforms to receive donations? I know there was a lot of online fundraising during the bushfires of January 2020 and um, you know, Facebook giving, for example, and, and GoFundMe campaigns yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, any, thought, any thoughts on this about fundraising online and online uh, fraud with donations? Sure. So look, on, online fundraising is, is here to stay. It's not, it's not changing. Um, mm. And it's, I think it's generally a good thing because it does facilitate that activity. Uh, I think where we want it to be targeted is using reputable sort of platforms to do so. So, you know, whether it's PayPal giving or Facebook or, or, or some other reputable platform that a, a charity's taken in, I don't see that as being a mm. escalated sort of risk. I mean, wow, the, what we saw through the through the bushfire, it's actually too much money coming in in a lot of cases, <laughs> but that's not a progress sort of problem. Yep. Um, I would say that an electronic transfer coming in is always going to be safer than cash in the sense that it's bank to bank and there's all, and there's and there's a record there. Um, I wouldn't discourage against cash raising or um, in whatever form that is. Mm. Because it is, a, it is a long term and a valuable way of getting funds into the sector. Mm. Um, charities do need to think. It is probably more at risk of essentially theft at the point of collection. Yeah. Right. Um, but that's where that's where the charities, I guess, processes and people really and culture really comes in to provide a, a degree of, of protection against it. Yeah. Right. Or, or protection of that collection. Mm-hmm. Ollie, any thoughts on Thank online you. fundraising and, and its susceptibility to fraud? Uh, no, I, I mean, I agree with everything James has said. I think the key is is the charities that are going to use those means need to understand how it works uh, and therefore evaluate the risks. Mm. Um, and, and similarly to, to, to what you said on, on cash, James, um, look, the, the, the priority for all charities is to make it as easy as possible to, to, to gain donations in whatever form they come in. Um, with cash, though, there is a long history in the sector of, of using it and of, of collecting donations that way and a load of really good practice out there from perhaps some of the more mature charities have been doing it for a long time so um, if, if, if anyone is concerned about the way that they're receiving cash donations and how to better protect those um, it's a great idea to leverage the, uh, the charity community at large where there's some really great practice. Yeah so just turning back to the, the online stuff for one uh, minute and this is probably like an HFC scam watch sort of aspect to it is people misrepresenting themselves as being the charity online mm. and collecting into their own private bank account. Now there's not a lot that a charity can can do about that because it is a private individual engaging in fraud. Um, but where they can take action, where they become aware of that, whether it's through environment scanning or members of the public raising it with them saying, hey, is this you? Is this is you know what's going on here? The charity can have a look into it, mm. raise it with authorities like the HFLC and try and shut that that fraud down. And they mm. the authorities can try and shut that fraud down so yeah it's not the charity doing it um but they can help by referring information to the right agencies yeah right <clears throat> and then the mechanisms set up by those agencies can then um, you know crank along and, and and do what they're supposed to do i suppose um another question 
actually th this one's um completely different topic I, I suppose it's about um work overseas so there's been a few questions about preventing and mitigating fraud overseas um well firstly on a practical level how how best to do this and, and are there any tips or special considerations for operating in other jurisdictions and i suppose um, what's linked to that is um, obligations to uh, whether it be regulatory bodies or, or um, under anti anti money laundering legislation that sort of thing. Um, if you are working overseas, um, Ollie, I'll, I'll go to you first on this one. Uh, I, I won't talk about the the external conduct standards. I'll, I'll leave that to the expert James. Um, <laughs> but what I would say on this is uh, there's no silver bullet um, to this question, right? Working overseas has a really special risk profile. There's a lot to take into account, um, and particularly if that's going to be in countries where the overall fraud and corruption risk levels are much higher. So if that's what you're doing, you need to take a holistic approach to making sure you've got the right framework in place to preventing, protecting, and then responding to these issues. And Matt, if you'll forgive an outrageous plug, um, I have two books that may help you. This one will help international charities working <laughs> in those circumstances. Um, and coming out next month is this one around terrorist diversion um, and how you can uh, manage the risk of your uh, resources falling into the hands of um, sanctioned entities. We will we will forgive the out, outrageous <laughs> plug there. Um, great great books, no doubt. Um, I haven't had a chance to read read them yet, Ollie, but I'm sure. The um, people that do read them will will find lots of gems in there for um, uh, practical tips for their own organisation. Sorry, what was the what was the title of the second one? The the one coming oh, out. Sorry, that was, uh, that's terrorist diversion: a guide to prevention and detection for NGOs. A catchy little title. Right, right, yep, yep. And I suppose mostly relevant for organisations that do have work in in areas more susceptible to um, identify terrorism, right? Uh, yes, but those areas are wider than a lot of people think. So it's also right, about okay. working in places where sanctioned entities are fundraising. So I think everybody would, for uh, example, yep. recognize you know, Somalia as, as, as a country of risk, but actually countries on the border with Somalia are places where Al-Shabaab is known to fundraise. So actually the mm. risk lives in, in places like Kenya as well. Similarly, there are also forgotten conflicts and forgotten issues around the world. Uh, people wouldn't realize, for example, these kinds of risks also exist in places like the Philippines uh, rather than the places that we more readily associate with these risks. Yeah, right. Good point. And, and I suppose that's a, that's um, something that does slip the mind of lots of people because some of these the names of these countries you don't automatically associate with um, that sort of risk. But it's important to know the the relation. James, uh, Ollie did mention external conduct standards. There is one that does uh, touch on fraud and corruption specifically. Is is there anything that people in charities with operations overseas should uh, think about for mitigating fraud? Sure. Look, yeah, there's one that goes to fraud. There's another one requiring reporting from a third party that you engage with. Mm -hmm. And I guess in a lot of um, in a lot of what we say, noting this is quite new legislation, it's only really been an issue for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, is a vast majority of the Australian entities engage a third party overseas. So another a charity that's operating over there. So there's a, re a relationship as opposed to direct delivery in a lot of cases, particularly around smaller and medium rather than your sort of large international charities. For those smaller and mediums, I guess it's probably two things you want to be doing. One is make sure you know who you're working with. And that's some, something you need to um, establish before the engagement and continue to monitor throughout the engagement as best you can. I think the second part is if you're sending money, do it through reputable channels. So bank mm -hmm. to bank sort of transfers, Western Union, whatever, not endorsing a particular product. Um, but also the other thing that we see sometimes is money going from the charity to an individual overseas. And I right. think we would prefer that the money went from the charity to an organisation overseas because mm -hmm. that organisation is going to have more people looking at what's happening and there's usually a greater capacity sort of to sort of review and audit. So from a, a couple of practical aspects, send it electronically and send it to a, an organisation, you're probably in a in a stronger sort of point. Yeah, yeah, good, good um, pieces of advice, practical pieces of advice there. And of course, there may be difficulties in doing uh, such things, but but it, it's worth taking the the time to think through those processes and make sure you've got the right ones in place to 
to go as far as you can to mitigate these sorts of um, instances of fraud or at least the potential for fraud. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because a large amount of the work, you know, isn't necessarily post-conflict. It's not it isn't necessarily to terrorism risk countries. So in those more stable sort of environments, it's a lot easier, and we understand that for charities to sort of set up these processes. Okay, I think that we've hit the one o'clock mark, and that brings us to the end of our time today. Um, before we do, before we do finish up, I'll, I'll give you both the floor to make any final comments or suggestions or advice or anything you'd like. Uh, it's a bit of freestyle here for you. Um, if if you want to take the opportunity to talk to the audience, um, Ollie, any, anything you'd like to pass on to the audience before we finish up today? Uh, just to finish on a really positive note, that um, when I first entered the, the charity sector, you know, more than a decade ago, this was not a risk or an issue that people were really talking about. Mm. Um, you know, there was a very low degree of awareness, but but here we are today, um, and it's uh, it's much more readily known, it's much more readily understood, and a lot of charities are doing really awesome work uh, to tackle these risks. So uh, we've come a long way already, um, and there's still some distance to travel. Yeah, great, James. Sure. Uh there's a lot of guidance available to charities through our website. It's probably a good first point of contact. You'll find that a lot of the work that's been done around fraud prevention in other fields and other areas as well is actually applicable. We're organisations, you know, that that you can draw draw rules across there. And of course, there's all these books as well. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. And there's a good point about other organisations. Don't, don't necessarily think of the charity sector as being in a unique position whereby nothing from other industries or areas can help. It, of course, there are lessons and, and underlying principles that can be applied to, to charities as much as they work for other organisations. Okay, well, that does bring us to the end of today's webinar. I know that we didn't quite get to all the questions and we, of course, we weren't able to address them live with Ollie and James and, and I do apologise for that. There was um, quite a lot of questions coming through. So we will endeavour to get back to you all via email. We're not going to leave any questions hanging. So we apologise for not being able to address them now, but we will get to them in writing. Just before you do, leave a couple of things that you can check out if you want to stay in touch with these issues we discussed today and the stuff with the charity sector and the ACNC more broadly. There's lots of web guidance touching specifically on these issues on the website. You can have a look at that. The Charitable Purpose is an e-monthly newsletter that goes out to all subscribers. You can subscribe to that on our homepage. More webinars, podcasts about various topics on our website. And if you've got any uh, questions about your charity, just in general, go to advice at acnc.gov.au. And we're um, pretty active on those social media channels down there. We have recorded today's session and I will, uh, we will put this on the website for viewing later, as well as our YouTube channel. And we'll send out a follow-up email that contains lots of links to all the resources we mentioned today, as well as a link, um, as well as a copy of the slides as useful as they may have been for you and a link to the video. So you can watch it at a later date. And finally, if you have any um, questions, comments or feedbacks about the webinars in particular, educationacnc.gov.au is the address to address those. And um, as we finish this, I think there'll be a short survey that pops up at the end. So if you're inclined to give immediate feedback in a survey that takes oh, probably less than 20 seconds to complete, because there are only think two questions, maybe, maybe three questions from memory. If you can take the 20 or 30 seconds to fill that in, we'd really appreciate it. We do get a lot out of the feedback in that post webinar survey. So thank you very much for your attendance, everyone today. We really appreciate it. It was um, well attended and, and we hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you very much, James, for um, giving us your insights and knowledge over on this topic from your vast experience. Not sure no worries. I mean, oh, there is. <laughs> and Ollie, thank you very much for helping the ACNC out with um, uh, this webinar on fraud. Given your expertise in the area, we really greatly appreciate you being able to impart some of your knowledge and expertise for the audience. My absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. It's now one o'clock. Well, Melbourne time, it's one o'clock. I'm sure if you're watching from a different jurisdiction, you've got a different time. But nonetheless, it is um, time to wind up the webinar and we'll see you um, next webinar, which is likely to be in the new year. So thank, thanks very much for your attendance today.